The Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Great to be in. Welcome to it. Weekend edition. Hail Varsity Radio presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, Will Wilson. Will Wilson just sleeps here. God love him. As if you're out and about this morning, it's Planet Hoth outside. The wind is whipping around. It is straight up playoff football weather outside in the snow. So before you, you make a snowman or... I don't know, put Rover out, uh, settle in. Two hours, plenty of Nebraska thoughts with us. You can join us this morning at 466-3776-800-825-5865. can find us on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio. Chris Schmidt at uh, Will on the radio for Will Wilson. Cranek is not tweetering uh, in the 2022 era. Uh, we have Mark Cranach. That's incredible. Cranach, good morning. How uh, how are you doing? How the, how's the weather up your uh, your neck of the woods, brother? Beautiful, beautiful, sunny, seventy four. <laughs> uh, you're on vacation somewhere, is what you're telling me. Yeah, it's got the you know it sounds cold. You know it's, those things it's, like it's, it just sounds cold, and like when the planes and helicopters fly over, they even sound different. It's one of those times. Um, but it might be good. It might be good sledding weather today. It is. Okay. You, you had a couple little ones. You'll take sledding. Junior has his first uh, intramurals, brother, basketball uh. game. Yeah, he decided not to get cut from Lincoln Southwest freshman team, so he's playing, you know. Uh, smart. <laughs> he's smart. <laughs> he is playing uh, intramural ball with his buddies. Uh, one of his best friends is coach. And to uh, to make it seem real, he is going to borrow Junior's suit that he wore for confirmation because he's going to wear a suit on the sideline. Hmm. <laughs> now, here, the weather is such that I, I was surprised. Like, if, if Memorial Stadium was a dome, <laughs> then this weather wouldn't matter, right? Uh-huh. That, and, surprisingly, though, was not part of one the of the 7,000 questions asked in the Memorial Stadium survey sent out by Trev Alberts and the athletic department this week. Please enlighten me. I am not a season ticket holder. I need to know, Cranach, you are. You're up on the east side. You and George Jefferson, uh, it, it's it's all good. I've sat with you before. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we, we get to shake hands with the sun. That's okay. We're, uh, we're far up. Um, I'm. Uh, we have a lot to get to with uh, the announcement of – Applewhite and Bush had a great chat last night with Joe Glenn. We're going to have Joe Glenn on the show Monday, former Wyoming coach and coach at South Dakota, Pride of Pius. He uh, recruited, coached, and was the head coach when uh, Applewhite was at Wyoming as as an assistant coach. So I'm looking forward to that Monday. But uh, Joe's awesome. He says, what's up to, to everybody in Lincoln? Uh, you have... The official announcement of Bush, you have raises given. You have a monster recruiting weekend. Chubba Purdy is in and doesn't seem to mind snow. That's okay. Uh, things are trending good that direction. I mean, we, we have a, a slew of things. We have Nebraska basketball to, to whine oh. about. I'm glad I, I did not invest my Friday night into watching. I, I caught all Muleheisen and KP for a bit. And uh, then I caught a bit of Fred's post game between uh, an outing with uh, with Mama and some friends before we headed to the bar. And uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed a Friday night free of Nebraska basketball. I can what still. Was, what was Fred post game? I, I didn't listen. I actually watched a lot of the game, but wasn't really interested in the post game. Was it kind of typical? Like we got to find a way to compete, or what? well, it, it wasn't the tone of our kids laid down and quit. It was more, and I know you lose by damn near thirty for, they what a fourth time this year. Yeah. Um, it, okay. Well, I think it was more of, um, well, how how do you want to die, right? That's that was the the challenge facing Purdue. Uh, they're monsters inside. They're incredible 
outside and you com- you combine that with a, a team that's you know a two seed right now that just competes right they want to go murder you they want to go beat you by a hundred from a mindset standpoint and a mentality it's going to happen they're going to do that to some teams in the big 10 they're going to they're, i mean our records already beat them this year but point is is on a given night if they're clicking and you're what you are it's going to be a bad night for a lot of basketball programs so it wasn't sure. uh it wasn't a our kids folded thing it's like damn they're that good uh, and, and that might be true, but what, what was alarming to me? Yep. And look, that's a top 10 program. So, you know, you set your bar, I guess, realistically high, but is just how physically weak. Oh, yeah. Nebraska looked compared to Purdue, like just physically. You're talking. It the, looks the, like the grown ass man parameter of basketball. Yeah. Like across the board. Um, not just height, but I mean, just physically girth <laughs> strength. <laughs> We had a girth um, sighting at seven twelve this morning. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, it wasn't even close. It, it was just like they were—they were just so much. They were so outmatched physically, and I'm like, how the hell? In year three, <laughs> I can tell you how the hell you don't recruit in state. You go after kids that are transfers and they're not starting, and there's a reason they don't play or or their role is complementary and and that's how you build your team year after year and you hit reset year after year like it's an AAU squad that's that that's why you get physically demolished in the Big 10 because you don't build for uh, a, an old veteran team you're always switching the roster except for Derek Walker by I the like way. I like D Dub man he's money he is a yeah, and, and freaking bless warrior him, like for trying to stand in there yeah you know, it's six seven, six eight, or whatever. Um, he's really, he's really gotten himself into good physical condition too. Looks so much different compared to last year. He's not the issue, but it's just like, where, where else is the toughness coming from? It's on the bench where right is, like, now, waiting for his foot to at heal. The rim coming from. Yeah, even, even when McGowan's and Verge get to the lane, they're not going in strong, right? No, they're, it's they're usually they're, kind they're of like a to, fade away. They're trying tricky. to draw a whistle. Is what they're doing. Yeah, it's man, and they just yeah they just get manhandled physically. And now Purdue is one of the extremes. I mean, I'll give you that. Like they're they're one of the extremes. They are one of the most physically imposing teams in the Big Ten, right? Um, but Nebraska is the least. And so when you see those two together, you're just like, <laughs> what? You don't have a chance. I mean, even in warmups, you're like, that ain't going to work. <laughs> you've got a real no way. You've got yeah, a real Nebraska's finesse not problem. They're not even going to come close. Cranek, you've got a real finesse problem oh. with Nebraska athletics, aside from Will Bolt, Coach Williams, and uh, and in Husker volleyball, right? Think of your three programs that have been good. What are they about? They're about toughness. They're about physicality in their own realm. Yeah. And then you have football that, you know, they don't get pushed around on the line of scrimmage anymore, but you don't have a, a physical running back right now. You're, you're working on that. Uh, yeah. And with basketball, to your point, you're all finesse going to the rim. You're trying to get a whistle and, and, and be fluffy, be wow, and instead of just dropping the hammer and initiating contact. It's what you it's, got. Yeah. I mean, you need an entire overhaul of whatever the hell you're doing recruiting wise mm-hmm. and how you're assembling. I mean, an entire overhaul. Like what, what, whatever your plan was, throw in the garbage because it's you're but, on th- like, your dude, three of you, this plan of let's go get the best Juco and transfer dudes and land a five star and go get the air quote best three point <laughs> international uh, Three point artist who, quite frankly, is a monster liability for you defensively. And I know he led the team in scoring, Kise did. But so what? I mean, he scored 11 points on finally shooting four or five. Doesn't matter. You got beat by 30. Yeah, listen. And <laughs> it, almost, it almost doesn't even look real when you read it and you're just like, oh, well, he's getting fired. 
Um, no, he is Nebraska's not. Nebraska's <laughs> road record under Hoiberg. One in 27, Cranach. What in, in the Big Ten, yeah, it's one in 27. Like just, just say that out loud and listen to that. One in 27 in the Big Ten on the road. And he's keeping his job. Now, look at overall, it's five and 41. Like what? Right now, Tim I, Miles is in uh, Northern California, arms cross in. I don't look too bad, do I? Yeah. I mean, those are putrid numbers. But then it comes out this week about his buyout. <laughs> And how he got an extra he got an extra year tacked on with Bill Moose. You know how that went down? This is hypothetical. But Fred during the summer is like, hey Bill, want to go to the club and play golf? Sure. Hey ba- hey Bill, you wanna you wanna go to the the, the, the club bar afterwards? Sure. Hey, uh, Bill, uh, we've had a good day today. How about we extend things? Sure. I mean that's that's it. That's how that went down. Could, actually, could be. actually you know, if if uh, Moose's future was in doubt, and, and Tom Chattel had a money column on this, I think it was Thursday or Friday. You know, at the time, you want to lock your guy up because of COVID. You extended Frosty after a, a tough second year by a couple of years, right? In 2019, he got two years tacked on. And no one really. I mean, there was some some whining about it, but overall, you got to keep that seven year window going, right? Well, the 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 problem isn't from a timing standpoint post COVID keeping Fred around, despite you know a couple of tough years. It's all right. Nobody knew about it. You could have looked, but but why look? Because who in their right mind at at this current moment in time would have extended Fred? Well, a year and a half ago. It was probably a discussion point to keep him around. Yeah. It's all about timing and hindsight. And, totally. uh, and and right now, it's it's horrific hindsight right now. And, and Bill Moose is off on the ranch, man, playing Yellowstone. Well, it, look, it would cost $18.5 million uh, dollars to fire Fred. <laughs> yes, it would. $18.5 I don't million. Wanna, dollars I don't want to fire Fred. I, 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 I can't. I can't excuse what their results are. I can't excuse their recruiting philosophy. I can't excuse the basketball IQ with who he brings in. The the kids don't listen to him or it takes seven games in before he starts benching people. I can't excuse his management. But when I think of a good basketball guy and you talk to people in all different leagues, internationally, you talk to folks in the NBA, you talk to folks in the Big 12, you talk to Tom Izzo. I mean, you talk to, to, to folks that are basketball dudes, and they're like, no, Fred's money. And, and, all of that, <laughs> and all of that can be true, but it sure as hell ain't money right now. Yeah, well, like, I mean, it's one of the f- first times, I think, out of any coach that I've followed at Nebraska in any sport where it is just so blatantly obvious that they just got to go. I, you know, I mean, do you think Riley he, do you think he wants one, guess, do you think he wants to like, do you think he wants to be here? I, well, there, there, look, how do you go? You almost have to try to go <laughs> five and forty one on the road. Like what? Five and forty one. You get you've gotten one Big Ten road win. One was that Penn State out of twenty eight tries. Like, come on, man! Like that, you're, you're. It's like it was Penn State. It was, it was bringing in Teddy, Teddy buckets to to hit that buzzer beater before he got yeah. booted. Well, hey, this is a and this is a manual count, so don't quote me on this, but it's around here. Guess how many scholarship athletes have walked through the Hendricks Center since Hoiberg has been here? How, how many people? How many different human beings have been on scholarship? I'm going to say thirty six. It's twenty seven. Yeah, I, I aimed high. 27. That's nuts. That, 27 people in three years. You And you can't find five to maybe get road win number two on the road? <laughs> NC State, they took them to four overtimes. Can we count that? You know, yeah. Well, look, and that was close. Look, I, I, yeah, look. Been it's a not, been, bright it's spots. not been all bad. <laughs> but, but that's your bright spot, right? 
a four overtime loss at North Carolina State's a bright spot. You know, meanwhile, you got these, like you mentioned, Chris, like you have like four 30 point losses or something like that. I mean, come on. Hey, my boy's watching it last night and he's just literally saying out loud, he's like, Daddy, what's I don't wrong with this anymore? Daddy, what's he wrong with the bre- what? Daddy, like, what's no, no, wrong no, with Nebraska back. basketball? I All don't kinds know, of weather. <laughs> you know? All stick together. You can't just be a friend. He's just like, refuse it. He's just like, I'm not watching this garbage. You know, there's a problem when, yeah, and Junior's a teenager now and he's 15 and the the time of father-son activity is fleeting because I'm a loser in his eyes. Say, hey, Junior, you want to go watch Nebraska basketball? I got a couple of seats. Let's go get a burger. Let's go hang out. I'm good. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. Can you get me a football seats? Sure. How about club? Do it yourself. You know? I mean, at least he's at least he's interested in Nebraska football. He was engaged and, and, and just genuinely jacked about going to watch a three and nine team because they were in it to break your heart. Uh, every ball game, right? Then there's basketball, which he loves. Loves it. And I, I couldn't pay him to go. It's a, it's a problem. It's a problem right now. Speaking of paying him to go, Chris, we, we mentioned it earlier, the uh, Memorial Stadium Improvement Experience Survey. How was by that? the University of Nebraska. How was that, donor? You tell me. How was it, the, the survey? I love Trev, and I think he's – that's really cool that he's got a survey out there. Lay it out for us. Non-season okay, ticket well, holder. I will so, tell you, it was thorough. Very thorough. Um, and it sort of became a choose-your-own-adventure. Like, because you answered this – <laughs> that would lead to a whole nother slew of questions, right? Yep. Um, they, I, I will tell you this, with, with that survey, it is clear to me that they are considering everything at that stadium. And it, it felt like their goals were a few things. One was to just kind of gauge interest on different ways that they could add, uh, I'll start here, with, with like p- premium seating. Yep. So and they they asked and they they showed you like examples like here's like a loge box here is a luxury box here is an on field level here is a sideline level here is an all you can eat sort of bar restaurant with open air patio here is this here it like showed you all the different kind ways mm-hmm. with examples of other schools and how they do it. And just kind of saying, would you be interested in something like this? Oh, you would. Okay. How much you would you be willing to pay for something like this? And then they would list a certain price point. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're like, wouldn't buy it all. They're like, well, what if it was this amount? No, not at all. What if it was this amount? <laughs> right? So they're, so they're not only gauging interest in the type of premium seating that they could add, but also trying to get an idea of like price points that they think the demand could, uh, that, that where they would meet the demand, right? And then beyond that, they're asking about food options. They're asking about sound system. They're asking about chair backs and comfort. Uh, They're asking about Wi-Fi, of course. They're asking about parking, stadium entry, stadium exit, like how satisfied you are with either of these things. What is the most important thing to correct out of any of those? Um, So super thorough. They said it would take 15 minutes. It took me like 25 uh, because there were that many questions. So um, I don't know. I just came away encouraged that they legitimately are considering everything. And the way things are answered will really shape how things go. That is impressive. Trev's got phenomenal business acumen, right? I mean, he looks the part of the CEO, but he is acting the part from a management standpoint and that is important right you've got all shapes and sizes and backgrounds of of husker nation that you need their input from and you've got folks that want to go to the football game because they grew up doing it and love nebraska football oh that was another one you just reminded me you've got folks that go and we'll go there in two seconds because they want to be seen, right? I mean, it's it's let's go to the club and do our thing. You've got folks also that that is their 
that is their family splurge, okay? Where they're not, and it's okay, they're not rolling in dough, but man, they make it work or they have, you know, a family connection. So it's been passed on. Uh, the grandfather clause where they're still in it despite maybe not having the income dear old dad had. I mean, there, there's there's so many different roads to take with this. But to me, it's it's about seating and comfort, right? You need a little more room on the wooden benches. And by the way, let's toss the wooden benches. There's the topic of alcohol sales. Make it more of a party. That was brought up. And first and foremost, you don't really care you know, what element you're in, if there's not enough elbow room or you want a different slice of pizza or bring back fountain Coke or whatever, start winning damn football games. I think that's the <laughs> echo. Start winning yeah. games first and foremost. But Cranach, dive in uh, a little bit further with uh, if you want to share some of your answers and, and how is this survey tailored to you? Because, again, you said your answers opened another door down a path uh for your voice yeah well one of them one of the first questions too by the way that was interesting and it's a it's a pretty important question it has consequences um but it talked about the grandfather clause and how you know there are multiple people in pretty nice areas of the stadium that don't have to donate or they donate a very little amount because it's you know grandfathered those tickets have been in their family for a long time and it asked the question would you be more interested? Do you think that's fair? Do you think that's okay? And I'm like, no, <laughs> I don't think that's okay. Um, because the, you know, the bulk of the stadium, the bulk of the season ticket holders, if you weren't grandfathered in by decades of ticket ownership, you have to donate a certain amount to be able to acquire a certain level of seat. And the fact that there are a bunch of people that don't have to do that, it's like, hell no. Because that ultimately raises the price for everyone else. Mm -hmm. And and like, look, I appreciate that it's tradition. And, uh, you know, your your grandfather's grandfather had these seats back in the 30s or 40s or 50s or whatever. Great. But times have changed. <laughs> and now you need to pony up like everybody else. You've had decades uh, of carte blanche where you've not been shaken down. Maybe that's the wrong term. Uh, but you've not had to donate like the rest of us, and you have 10 times better seats. No more. It, I mean, and Meanwhile, Cranach, you've got, you've got seats. You want your little ones to someday have your seats, and you want to be able to afford those things. So when Nebraska win, not if, they get back, you don't want to turn into the Chiefs fan. Case in point, down at Arrowhead a month ago. Maybe maybe five weeks ago, we go see Vegas. We go see the Chiefs. Not necessarily diehard Chief fans, but it sounded like a good thing to do on a Sunday. Let's go watch NFL action. And you're sitting next to a, a couple of folks that have have been there since the Marty Ball and Okoye era. All right, go back thirty yeah. years. And they're like, "Yeah, we used to have four, but but the, <laughs> the seat licensing went from seventy five hundred dollars to fifteen grand." So we had to get rid of two seats to keep our, to keep our two. So they went from four to two, and they're paying double. But guess what? They're they're row nine, and they're at a, they're at an angle, and they're in the lower bowl, and they're happy. They aren't happy that the kids don't get to go anymore. But hey, they're still there. So they they made it work, but they had to sacrifice a little bit. So that's just what's up. It, it, that's how it works. That's how things roll. And I know it's not fair. And you've been loyal, and you've been dedicated, and you've donated supply and demand but there is kind of a, a a new era here knocking on the door and i remember just talking to to mom and dad's friends who when bill Byrne took over uh the old boosters of substance became a reality and there was a family that went to church with us that had 50 yard lines since the the 41 rose bowl team okay and they were all sorts of po'd because bill wanted Dollar Bill wanted way more money for those seats, and they wouldn't pay him. And they got out of being season ticket holders right before that 93 season. And we know what <laughs> happened with 93 through 99. Incredible era, right? So yeah. it is about, <laughs> 
you know, just it is about timing and there is uh, eventually a, a come to Jesus between the people in charge and those who pay to go. And you can choose to pony up or, or choose to go away. It's uh, not fair. It's not it's not ideal, but that's that's kind of the normal thing. And, look, and a lot of my feedback on the survey was kind of basic stuff. I mean, you could tell I, I'm glad Trev's there because I think he's. I think he's waking some folks up. Entitlements may be a strong word, but if you know, there, there's a. I think there's even a certain degree of that within the athletic department of kind of taking the fan for granted in some ways and not thinking through. He doesn't. Uh, right. Not thinking through a lot of things. Right. Like dumb things, basic things. Like, uh, okay, so this may sound really weird, but re- renewing season tickets along with that is a field to um, renew your parking. If you want to purchase parking in addition to your seats, mm-hmm. right? You literally, at least on mobile, I couldn't figure it out. Cannot deselect. I like, I didn't want to, I didn't want to renew the parking, okay. which is a whole nother thing because the reason why is because if you get parking and you get assigned to one of the garages downtown mm-hmm. and you park on one of the upper floors, it's like two hours to exit. Yeah, it is. <laughs> right? Because the cars not... <laughs> coming out of the garage are dumping right into downtown traffic, mm-hmm. and you basically get one car out per stoplight, right? <laughs> and so if you're at the top, I mean, you're There's like, no bar to go game. to, Cranac. There's no bar to go to. You can go to the Champions Club, but that's about it. If you want to get a, well, get fed and watered. But either way, it's I mean, that's ridiculous. Like, you're, this is paid parking. And it takes you two hours to get out of the garage, not not to get home or to leave, but and that's just paid parking. So I'm just exit. like, yeah. I'm done with that. Trying to trying to not <laughs> renew that. Um, but on the web, there's literally no way on the website to like cancel it. Your hotel California can't yeah, leave. Yeah, so you're just like, really, athletic department? Like you're just not even. No one thought of that. No one thought of the that somebody might want to cancel it. It's just it's, I mean, dumb stuff like that, you know, where you're like, come on. And then, two, it's sort of like you're really going to charge people that premium parking for a two hour exit experience. Like, what's the point of that? Might as well walk from Omaha. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, just, I don't know. It's just there. So I, I just appreciate that they they're they seem to be listening and paying attention to some of the details that are kind of overlooked and. Um, I, now it might take a long time for some of the stuff to come to fruition, but I, I guarantee you they are collecting opinions and data on what Nebraska fans want to see. And they are not leaving any possibility out. We'll hit more on the survey hour two. Brandon Vogel will get us kicked off and, uh, the iron horse, Gary Sharp. Plenty to get into. Uh, Husker football, a uh, big recruiting weekend. Nebraska basketball, uh, soul searching still. And the hall call happened this week with uh, one of the men that uh, made the pipeline great, Zach Wiegert. Our chat with uh, Zach Wiegert next on The Rewind. Great to be with you this uh, weekend edition of Hale Varsity. We're presented by the Nebraska Lottery. <laughs> Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, with Chris Schmidt and Mark Cranach. Back into it, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, and uh, one of the leaders of the pipeline, an All-American, a Nebraska Hall of Famer, now a college football Hall of Famer for the 2022 class, uh, Zach Wiegert with us. Zach, good to speak with you again. It's been a while, I think pre-Boulder. A great day for you. Congratulations on the College Football Hall of Fame. How do you feel? Oh, it's a great day. Um, you know, it's uh, you know you go on, you go on after college and you, you play play some ball and work and you don't really think about it and then you know you get a call and and you get in and then you start reflecting back to all the all the great times and great players you played with and you know I always have told my other linemen I'll mention them by name every time something like this happens. So Brandon Stey. Aaron Graham, Joel Wilkes, and Rob Zatica, this is as much a testament to them because you don't win stuff like this as an individual playing offensive line. So. You've always been one to kind of share the glory. You guys were an amazing unit, the standard in Nebraska football, and 
I want to go back to, to when you got to campus in 91. Was it an immediate chemistry with, with that crew, with the pipeline? Or did you guys have to kind of warm up to one another? You know, it was interesting. Um, you know, I had been around down there some just because my brother was playing. So right. I'd go down there and I, I knew quite a bit of the, the upper class. And just, you know, my brother's three years ahead of me. And, uh, you know, you get guys like uh, Brendan and, you know, Brendan and Joel and Robin us were all in the same class. Um, and so it was pretty much, you know, immediate. Uh, you know, I would say uh, that first year and really the summer between our first and second year where, you know, I, we just kind of found out that everyone, everything was a competition in our class and uh, no one liked to lose anything in our class. And, uh, you know, it just, it really just got, <laughs> it just kept growing year after year. It got more competitive. And, and uh, you know, I don't know how the other classes were uh, before or after us as much, but, uh, you know, it was, it, everything was a competition with us. And I think that, that really helped us because, uh, you know, no one ever wanted to be the weak link of anything, that's for sure. Zach Wiegers with us, Sale Varsity Radio, College Football Hall of Fame 2022. Zach, part of the class, got the call. And uh, you mentioned the pipeline. And who did you make better day after day, squaring off against that black shirt defense? And who made you better? I mean, a lot of great defensive linemen, a lot of great offensive linemen. Man, you guys complimented one another. Yeah, there was a lot, a lot of them, and uh, you know, I played next to Will Shield for two years, and I think we both complemented each other really well. And then mm-hmm. I was fortunate to play next to Brendan for two years, but you know, on the other side of the ball, you know, you had Trev Alberts, uh, John Perella, um, Dwayne Harris, Dante Jones. I mean, you name it. I mean, there was Terry Keneally. Um, I mean, I can maybe a laundry list of names that most of the fans of your show would know mm-hmm. that you know that I went against on a daily basis, and uh, you know it was always a good feeling when you show up on a Saturday to play, and you felt like the guys you're playing against were as tough as the guys you practice against. Toughness was a compliment given to you by so many of your peers, so many of your coaches. Was that something you always had, or did it kind of get refined as you you grew older? Well, uh, I'd like to think I could control it better as I got older, but uh, it was, um, I think that's kind of what made us unique is we always, as a group, we kind of always talk like, you know, the offensive linemen are supposed to be the protectors and the defensive line, the guys are the aggressors, and and we always said, well, why can't we be the aggressors? And um, I, I think... Hopefully, and the, and the film knows and the fans know. Hopefully, our play showed that that's how we win in the games. Is we just we just want to be more physical and tougher than everyone played against. Well, you guys did that. Zach Wiegert's with us on Hale Varsity Radio. First place Heisman vote. You finished ninth. Do you know who gave you the first place vote in '94? <laughs> no, I don't. I should buy him dinner or something. I wish <laughs> hey, if they listen to your show, I wish they'd give me a call. I owe one because I I've heard that a couple of times and. And I, and I appreciate it. I don't I know there's an offensive line with no stats is going to be a pretty hard sell. But uh, I would say that uh, um, if you watch this game tonight, it gets won on the offensive and defensive line. And I think everybody knows that. So, but uh, yeah, no, that was I remember I remember hearing that back in the day. But that's, uh, it was an honor that someone thought I should have won the Heisman Trophy for sure. Well, you guys uh, on the line need the credit, right? And well, you had the pancake stat. You had the. You never allowed any sacks stat, but I want to get into the Sunday morning pancake feed. I mean, what was the record uh, with with the pipeline group? Who took down the most pancakes with milk? Uh, you know, I, I don't remember. I think it was a toss up every year. Everyone eats till they were sick, but uh, <laughs> man, we could eat a lot of food back then. I mean, I remember we did some photos that people can probably dig up from somewhere, and we had a, a stack of pancakes in front of us that was, you know, three foot tall. And, and I have to say that that whole thing about went down, which is kind of scary to think, but. Um, yeah, we, we used to burn quite a few calories back in the day. <laughs> Zach, uh, there's there's footage out there of of the Orange Bowl, and there's been quite a bit on on Twitter with the, the national title game tonight. And there's different clips of different title games being shown. Of course, the Fiesta Bowl win over Florida, the win uh, by you guys against the U and Warren Sapp in Miami. Uh, the the heartbreak against Florida State the year before. And I remember watching the game, uh, and, and you're on the sideline, defense is out there, 
kind of piling away at, at Costa in Miami, and you're sitting there talking with Trev Alberts on the sideline. What were you guys talking about then? Do you remember? Yeah, no, I, I don't remember the exact situation, but, you know, it was one of those things where, yeah, yeah, things happen in a game, and it's just unfortunate you had some turnovers and things like that, and mm-hmm. it was just a conversation of like, you know, that we're going to get them, you know, where, you know, you just know, you just felt like it was, that we were going to get it done, and the same thing the junior year, you know, I mean, we just, we, we just had a mentality that we could beat anyone we played against the last couple of years I was there, and. Um, I don't remember ever having a negative conversation on the sideline of ever anyone thinking we weren't going to win any game we played, which is, you know, that's half a win in his belief, right? It, it is. And was there a tipping point moment in your career in Nebraska where, all right, um, we, we can believe, but now we kind of showed it. Was there a game that you point to? I, I think it was actually my – um, my sophomore year, we played Miami, a really good Miami team in the bowl game. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or maybe it was in Florida State. It was Florida State. We played them twice back to back. And it was one of those things is the year, you know, the, my freshman year, we played uh, the Miami team and then we played Florida State. And I just felt like from that one year to the next year, that we just seemed so much faster and we, we seemed like we were an aggressor and, and, Things were starting to change, mm-hmm. and as we were coming to be in to be juniors, my year where Trevor was a senior, you could really you could really feel the difference of just like how much faster practices felt, and um, you know how much more confidence everyone had, and you know we had like two or three years back to back to back, not not like single player on the entire team missed one workout, so you could just see the level of dedication and the level of talent just keep growing. Zach Wiegert. I would say that was probably it. Was probably that bowl game my sophomore year. Zach Wiegert's with us. Sorry to interrupt, Zach, but a Hall of Fame call for you for the College Football Hall of Fame 2022. Uh, get your thoughts before we say goodbye, Zach, and thanks again for a few minutes on your big day. Um, you look at, at Trev Alberts now, AD Trev. Uh, you've been close with Trev. Thoughts on on where he's at with this program. And then also, you look at Nebraska as they, they look towards 2022. How are you feeling about Nebraska football? Well, Trev's Tre- a winner. I've been around him for – I've known him for years and years. And Trev's a winner, and they, they couldn't have picked a better one to lead. To lead. Um, he knows how to get it done for sure. Um, I, I think with him, you know, in that position and with Scott where he's at, I think that uh, – you know they'll get the right people and players in place to continue to to, to grow the program. Um, like I said, I, I just have been around Trev too mm-hmm. long to to. I just know he's uh, he'll do work tirelessly to to bring back winning to Nebraska. I know that means as much to to him as it does to me and a lot of ex players. So, do you down for quite a few games, or what do you how do you spend your Saturdays? Yeah, no, I go to most games. Uh, I probably make, you know, 75, 80% of the home games and usually try to catch a couple of away games every year. So, yeah, I'm, uh, I've am I've got lots of tickets. So I'm a, I'm a big supporter. Good work. Uh, Zach Weger with us. Zach, uh, congrats on the Hall of Fame call. And uh, we'll do this again. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Take care. Early to rise with Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Here's Chris Schmidt and Mark Cranach. Winding down this first hour, weekend edition, Hail Bar City Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, Will Wilson in. If you're on about around Lincoln this morning, uh, be careful. Cold, icy, windy, it's no fun. Playoff football coming up here around 3.30. The Bengals and the Raiders, the fighting Joe Burrows and Zach Taylors and Stanley Morgans of the world, Try and advance uh, versus the uh, the Will Compton led uh, Vegas Raiders. That's being genuine and generous to uh, our, our friend from Bussin. But hey, good opening round, and then we think it's bad now. Wait till you go play in it, right? That's Buffalo, New England, the third act tonight. And um, man, it's it's interesting to uh, to just think about this time of year with playoff football. Just, I was working the old tuck rule game. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Did you know uh, Joe Burrow wanted to come to Nebraska? I knew I'm that, kidding. Mark Cranach. Thank you. Back to the survey here. We've got a couple of minutes okay. before we uh, 
we uh, take a time out and get in touch base with Brandon Vogel for hour two. But, Cranach, you were very thorough, and Nebraska's been very thorough with the questions asked and uh, the answers submitted. Trev's trying to make it that, that, that yes answer for everybody, it sounds like. Well, the other thing you notice is, because again, they included in the survey images and examples of what other schools are doing, and you you quickly realize how kind of far away from that Nebraska that Nebraska is. Uh, and then look, if if you were in the stadium last year or in recent years, you've seen even though it's an announced sellout, that's not the actual attendance. Right. <laughs> you know, you see a lot of you see plenty of empty seats. I mean, it just seems pretty clear that they're going to reduce stadium capacity overall um, to increase fam cuff comfort and to increase premium seating options. Um, but what that looks like and when and in what section, I mean, they were even getting down to, okay, if you're interested in this sort of premium seating option, would you like that to be in the North stadium, the South stadium, the East stadium, the West, how many seats would you, would you want to buy? What if it was at this price point? I mean, they're really diving in to figure out, what they should build, how much they should charge for it, like what are fans willing to pay? Um, I mean, it's, you know, it's not going to be just a shot in the dark. It's not going to be a guess. Like if you build it, they will come. It'll be based <laughs> on what fans are telling them, mm-hmm. uh, which is pretty cool. Well, we'll see where uh, Nebraska goes with it and the amenities and convenience versus how it's been set up is miles away now that it can't be fixed or done but to your point Cranach it's it's different uh, at a lot of other stadiums compared to what Nebraska has right now much like you know where the Nebraska football program is right now what they're trying to build towards that's bowl eligibility and, comp- and contention in the west they're still miles away from the lines of scrimmage you saw Bama and Georgia display on Monday night. Hour two is next. It's the weekend edition with Hale Varsity presented by the Nebraska Lottery. The Hale Varsity Radio Saturday morning show presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmidt. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28 and now roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. That me. Back with you, Tower 2, Hail Varsity Weekend, presented by the Nebraska Lottery. Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranach, and Will Wilson. Give uh, me a follow on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio. At Will on the radio is where you find Will on Twitter. Cranach, someday will get back on Twitter, perhaps. And uh, we welcome in managing editor with HailVarsity.com and magazine, his book with John Cook, Dream Like a Champion, Brandon Vogel with his head, Brandon L. Vogel. Vogues, Cranach, uh, some Twitter feedback to get into. Chris chimed in, and, and we kind of detailed, thanks to Mark Cranach, Cranach's survey from Trev Alberts, right? Cranach's a season ticket holder, and uh, Cranach, you're very thorough, bud. Thank you with kind of where the, uh, the the survey went, what you were asked. Chris chimes in about music, and Vogues is a music lover. Mm. Did the survey ask about music at the stadium? Chris says, so as, it, as I get older, it's hard to get pumped up to ACDC year after year, game after game. Bring back hip-hop. That, look, that was one of the things I wrote in. It, it didn't ask specifically, what do you think of the music? But it was one of the in-stadium experiences that you could select as either good or bad. Mm. And then there was an open comment section, and I did something real similar. I was like, the, the music feels tired to me. Okay. I feel like there there needs to be a little bit of a, a little bit more variety there. Um, so I hear you. Yeah, it's, and I wonder if it's like a Pavlov's dog situation too. <laughs> you know, like the team has lost so many times and has not, <laughs> has not made, last year being maybe an exception, right. has not gotten off the field on third down. Because it's like, oh, God, here comes that song again. Every it's time that song crew. comes on, we blow Kick a third down. my heart. Like, Come on now. <laughs> let's change it up. Vogues, you play DJ here. Give us some help. How are you, man? 
I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well. Um, uh, fortunately, I think it's a, uh, it's a little bit of a losing battle because you're never going to make everybody happy. I mean, I think the thing to do to sort of modernize that experience would be to, to hire a DJ in, in, in stadium DJ. And, you know, it's not something where, you know, some of these, they kind of cut to the guy in the, in the end zone or wherever he's at. And you say, Hey, here's what's happening. Here's, here's who's spinning these tracks. Um, I don't know if you need to go there, but having somebody in charge probably modernizes that a little bit, but then, you know, you do that and you'll have somebody saying, where's ACDC. So it's, it's a tough one. I mean, I think it's a, a good thing for this sort of survey, but uh, you're going to get kind of every response under the sun. And then what do you do with that? Here's, here's my take. Pull the players. What's going to get them juiced before game, in game? I mean, they're worried about, I pray, they're worried about their keys on third down. <laughs> their assignment I I I I pray that they're worried about whoever's coming off the edge on third and eight if they're an offensive lineman making the block or or blitz pickup or audible. I mean, right. So from a from an amped standpoint, whatever the players want to listen to to get them cranked up, I'm good with. In game, you know, you're just trying to to enhance the noise. And the fan base is incredible. Nebraska's traveled for for decades to uh, to road venues, to bowl games. It's been a while since they've had a, a chance to go to bowl games, but three and nine was still pretty well packed up in, in a in a in a really supportive way. Where you're coming out for Iowa, you're coming. I mean, who, who the hell goes to watch for three and nine football? Not Jacksonville fans, right? I mean. Nebraska football, really, uh, to the fans' credit, was there through thick and thin, through a ton of heartbreak. <laughs> and uh, I think that's important. But, yeah, the, the, the music's uh, there. Uh, our old buddy uh, Rock tweets in, did Hoiberg catch the moose after an extended night in the rail yard on the extension? Off the top rope this morning, Rock, thank you for that tweet. Vogues, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go to the, the Hoiberg and basketball dilemma in a moment. Back to uh, more of the survey discussion point. We spent a lot of time on it. Other news and notes this week we'll get to you. But overall, um, your gauge on Trev Alberts and, and what he's doing here, the job he's doing from a survey standpoint. Cranax uh, opened up quite a bit on, on what he's um, put down and, and responded with. You as a as a guy who covers Nebraska football, you know what 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 does this moment in time say to you between the fan base and and proposed improvements with the amenities? Yeah, I think it's been clear since Alberts uh, took over, and even if you know clear from his time at at Omaha that he's somebody who's constantly looking forward and. It puts him in this interesting position, given you know he was a, a Nebraska great. But it, it gets hard when you're a storied a program and a football experience as Nebraska has been in the past to have somebody who's going to kind of raise their hand and say, you know what, we we want to keep as much of that as we can, but we kind of got to get with the times here. And you know, I've I've seen some some parts of that survey and. You know, they're talking about wedge seating. And it's like, here's an example from Kentucky and South Carolina and wherever else. Um, So it's this is kind of his first, I think, big uh, offensive move in that to say, like, hey, we're going to modernize some pieces of this, but we're not going to do it without your feedback. Um, You know, and counterpoint that with him just kind of pulling the trigger on paper tickets, which was something that was simple, um, but was important to people. So. I think he kind of straddles both worlds in a way that makes him unique to to handle this a little bit because it's tricky. Brandon Vogel is with us on Hale Varsity Radio. Yeah, you're totally right, Brandon. Is it's the the level of detail that was in that survey was what was I guess the most reassuring to me as I took it, um, asking about ledge seating, load seating, on field, um, you know, different types of luxury suite layouts including pictures and comparisons to what other schools are doing collectively as you're looking at it too. There was even one about a year round like restaurant and social club 
which apparently exists at some other schools. Like, would you be interested in that? I'm like, no, settle down. Like, <laughs> okay, I need to go to the social club in Lincoln, or, you know. But um, it, the level of detail that they are trying to uh, acquire, and just and, you know, it's a bit of a gen, it's a bit of a cliche in some ways, but they're going to make data driven decisions. Like they really are, um, because each, depending on how you answered the survey, it would just dive deeper down that rabbit hole. And I, I think that's the thing that stands out about Trev that's maybe different is just the how detail oriented the guy is. And then h- how do you expect that to maybe manifest itself throughout the athletic department as he grows into his tenure here? Yeah, I think we'll see that first and foremost with sort of the facilities and some of the the fan experience that they can do. Um, I think we'll eventually see it as there's inevitable change amongst the coaching staff. I mean, coaching hires is still the, uh, the, I guess, front door for, for any athletic director. And with where Alberts came in, you know, Moose hired a lot of people, not just the, the, the high-profile names we, we talk about every week, but a, across sports. He made a lot of coaching hires. So there's not a lot right now for Alberts to do, um, though he may not have long, depending on how things shake out in a couple of ways. But I, I'll credit him for being patient on that. You know, I thought he came up with a pretty good solution for the current state of the football program. And until then, this will be a kind of our foremost look at, at how he's going to change things. And then the big ones will, will eventually come, whether that's via his choice or someone else. Brandon Vogel's with us, Weekend Edition, Hail Var City Radio. At Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter. Vogel's going to get to the, the two hires this week. Bill Bush announced early in the week, I think it was Tuesday and uh, Thursday, you had Brian Applewhite going to start off with your read and feel on, on Applewhite, his resume, and and his task with the running back room. How do you feel about the hire? Yeah, I, I like, I, I really like the, the Wyoming slash Colorado State kind of stretch of his career, first as a player and then as a as an assistant coach, you know, I know those places aren't physically close to Lincoln, but uh, ideologically, I, I think they are. And I, I think that helps. So you have someone who, you know, has been in Texas for the past couple of seasons, has, has which, which helps you in the past two seasons. But he's also, you know, going to Lincoln, Nebraska, isn't going to be totally unfamiliar with him. And, you know, we all kind of know, and I think there was a lot of support for this hire, at least from the fan base, that Ron Brown was kind of there as an option. Um, so for the fact for Nebraska to go outside of that tells me that they must have seen something they liked quite a bit in, in Applewhite. And going through his kind of career history, you know, there's there's not a lot there that says, no, this wasn't the pick. You know, with Brandon, with him and his Texas ties, Bill Bush and his just general recruiting acumen, Mickey Joseph with his general recruiting recruiting acumen plus a, a specific territory in Louisiana. Um, it, it feels like Nebraska significantly upgraded its recruiting uh, operation uh, more so you think than what you could have expected Scott Frost to have landed, considering they were coming off of three wins. Yeah, I I do think so, particularly on the recruiting front, because, you know, you step back and look at this, and it it doesn't take a a genius to to see. Nebraska didn't have a ton of leverage here in terms of going out and trying to compete for the the best assistant coach you can have. I mean, Scott Frost restructured his payout to – I mean, it's it's as clear an indication as any that, hey, time's getting short and something needs to change here. And Frost, to his credit, took, you know – took the, the risk on that, and Trev said, okay, that seems fair for both parties. But if you're an assistant coach, you know, if you're out there trying to pry and Mark Whipple away from Pitt, you know, he's got a good job. He's got a P5 job. He's coming off probably his best season as a coordinator yet. Um, you got to try and, and – that comes into, into play somewhere around the, in, in those discussions of just Nebraska's current situation. You can't – you know, you're not walking into Clemson. Um, for example. So I think that being considered, they did pretty well. Um, with, you know, 
I, I look at it, we know more about the recruiting part of it at, at this point, I think. I mean, you know, Bill Bush, Mark Whipple, even Terry Joseph, or Mickey Joseph, excuse me, uh, have, have been around a lot. So it's not like they're, they're inexperienced, but recruiting's been kind of the, the main selling point to this point, and, and I think that's okay. Bogues, let's get into some of the uh, the weekend visitors in, in Nebraska. While being limited with the high school athletes they brought in for 2022, they've done really well. I think 11 kids from the portal have come through. Nebraska's waiting on a you know a portal kid from from the U to maybe make a call on the defensive line, and, and then of course Chuba Pretty, you know. Let, let's spend a second here on, on what has impressed you right now with that combination of high school and portal. Uh, just spend a second here on just what, what Nebraska's done here with a new staff and a do-or-die year. Yeah, I, I think they, they've done a good job of adding experience at their – places of greatest need. So you've got somebody coming in in the secondary. I think they'd still like to to get another offensive lineman if they could. They had one scheduled to come this week, and, and now he's not. Um, so, so that one kind of remains to be seen. And maybe you'd like somebody on the, on the defensive front slash, well, yeah, on the defensive front. I mean, I think if you could find a – uh, a big nose tackle, you'd take him. And if you could find an edge rusher, which everybody's trying to find, um, you'd, you'd take one there as well. So, so far, I think they've, they've addressed some of their biggest needs, and they obviously got, got a quarterback who's an experienced starter and, and might end up with another one uh, before this, this week's out. So all things considered, they, they, they kind of checked the boxes that they needed to, and, and I think that's, that's pretty good for mid-January. You know, there's going to be a second wave of of the portal, uh, most likely after most schools finish spring football and position battles kind of shake out one way or the other. So, I mean, there'll there'll be additional attrition for Nebraska too at that point. So, you'll sort of have a round two uh, of of portal musical chairs, I guess, for lack of a better term. But as far as round one goes, yeah, I'll score that one in Nebraska's favor. Hey, Brandon, let's do a quick um, volleyball transition before hitting hoops. A couple things on volleyball. Are we allowed to still like Jordan Larson? What the hell is that? She's coaching at Texas. Um, and then two, Nicklin Hames' decision to come back, yet apparently cede the setter position to the upcoming uh, upstart Kennedy Orr. What does that decision say about John Cook, about Nicklin Hames, and about Kennedy Orr? Yeah, um, on the Jordan Larson front, I think yes, uh, except for if we, Husker fans can still root for her up until December. At that point, Texas and Nebraska might face off, and, and then it's, it's pure hatred for whenever that occurs. And then we go back to the original setting. So that'll be fine. I, I did feel like Texas as coach was, was trolling Nebraska a little bit with that hire, uh, not because she's obviously – one of the most accomplished volleyball players in the world. She obviously is, but just given the history between those two, it's like, okay, maybe this is a little uh, twisting of the knife. But as for as for the other decision, I think it's it's fascinating, and we really don't know much about it at this point beyond it's happening. But I think one, it speaks very highly of Kennedy Orr. I mean, she was a top ranked recruit in in that class, and. Had every reason to expect she's going to be pretty good. Um, this tells you even even more. We didn't get to see very much of her this year. Um, that things seem to be on track there. From from Nicklin's perspective, you know, I think it it really underscores for me how much she wants to to transition to that coaching role, which is you know no surprise. Both her parents are coaches, um, and this is a great opportunity to do that. You know, it's important because you know I was talking with Jacob this week who, who covers volleyball full time for us and like okay she's going to change positions but where's she going to go like it's it's not easy to to slot her in right now so that's the piece i'm really interested in finding out more about and then for cook um i think it's further proof that like he's not afraid to 
to do outside of the box things. He's not afraid to try things. He's not afraid to think of, you know, who knows how this idea came together, but of like, well, hey, what if we did this? Uh, you know, it reminds me a little bit of redshirting Kelly Hunter as a sophomore. You know, that's, it's just, it's not something you do. Um, but he saw a benefit in it, talked to Kelly about it. She did it and then ended up playing out perfectly for Nebraska. So, you know, we look at a lot of successful coaches and they become real task max, task masters of it's got to be this way. And this is how we do things and this and this and this. And you kind of really try to stick to the plan and hopefully it works. Coach Cook's kind of ready to rewrite and, and redraw the map at plenty of different turns. And it's one of my favorite things about following this program. Bogues, we'll let you get out on this. Um, you're a you're a proud father. You've got a little one. Junior's uh, crawling around when I check in with you. Are you comfortable letting him watch Nebraska men's basketball on TV? <laughs> Most of most of the, the the horror starts after his bedtime, so <laughs> it's just a, it's just the weekends we've got to be we got to be worried about. And we don't have to now. I actually, I tell you what, I, I was giving him a bath, so I didn't get the Nebraska game flipped on until I think ten minutes in, and they <laughs> they flashed the stats. I'm like, Nebraska's shooting forty seven percent, and they're down like fourteen. It's just like, man, it's. There's there's nothing you can point to with that team and say, well, come hell or high water, this is what they're going to do well. And, I mean, that's a really simplistic view of it, but I think when you get to the heart of it, there's just not a ton of identity to it right now. Sometimes the effort's good, as Fred Hoiberg has said uh, on certain occasions, the effort has not been good, and it's, it's getting tough uh, here in January of – of the third season, and you're still kind of waiting to see, like, okay, what's this team about? That That's just it. Uh, and it comes back to why are you here? Are you here to win and, and play hard for one another? Are you here because it's a stepping stone till you get on to the, the next? And I feel that there's been too much sunshine pumped about NBA pedigree, and I know you got to sell what you got. Okay, what's your what's your history? What's your background? And Fred is front office NBA head coach, uh, you know, miracle worker or resurrector uh, at Iowa State. Okay, <laughs> and and all those things you got to lean on with with what you've done, right? Be proud of that. And and now you come to Lincoln, and you're in year three, Vogues, and. You've just you've just missed. You, you look for talent and some skills, but brother, you've not you've not checked into what makes a guy. Not everybody, but some guys tick. What's their character like? I mean, are they going to fold and tap out, or does okay. it does it kill them when they lose? And it doesn't feel like that. Twenty seven scholarship basketball players mm-hmm. since Hoiberg has been here. Twenty seven. I mean. <laughs> And, and, and that's, that's, I think, the position they're stuck in right now. So if you're going to do that, like your kind of grand program vision, if you're going to turn over that much of the roster each year, um, it, it kind of has to take a backseat of like, we're going to play this way and this is what we believe in. You still got to have that stuff. But your primary objective then becomes you've got to build a strong team and a team that wants to be together and play together. And it's made more challenging by the fact that, well, 80% of it seems to turn over each season. And so it, it's a little bit of a shift of focus, I think. And it becomes real easy for coaches like Hoiberg, who are clearly very, very intelligent and very well-versed in the game. I think we see this with football a little bit, too, to kind of not just focus on the, like, the interesting part of it and the part that they know best and their greatest strengths, uh, if the results aren't coming, you, you got to switch it up and say, well, maybe we need to put our focus on something, some other piece of it, because certainly some piece seems to be missing. Got an email in here, Chris at HaleVarsity.com, and good stuff from Uncle Kelly. He uh, writes in, you know, you've got Fred that's been in talent acquisition mode each year, but what's the, what's the construction look like, right? What's What's the regard been for building a team? And let's just go accumulate all this talent, guys, and worry about it fitting, <laughs> you know? 
and and that's that's just the truth of it because Fred knows basketball. But you want to talk about like just going to your job and hating it? He's got to be getting into that neighborhood because it's yeah. never ending. Yeah, his frustration is pretty apparent at times, and and that's that's a change I think from from previous seasons. And you're right; it's with the roster. It's not like you can look at this team and be like. Oh, they're just a year away. Uh, I look at this team, and it like if if they don't get a couple of Big Ten wins, or even if they do, like what's it going to look like next year? You're, you're going to probably going to have a ton of turnover again because right now things don't seem like they're a ton of fun. No, and do they win again? Like people say, yeah, they'll win a couple of Big Ten games. They'll win four. They'll get to ten wins. I don't know. I mean, the the Big Ten, Nebraska is it. Nebraska's the the yes at last call, okay? That's who they are in this league. Everyone else has at least got some sort of, you know, courage to to go pull off a win or an upset. And then there's the really, really good teams (laughs) that that can kill you outside and in like like a Purdue. So I feel bad for him, but it's kind of of his own making, you know? I mean, he's the one who uh, put the menu together. Bogues, what are you yeah, working well, on? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> working on the January issue, um, which goes to press middle of next week. So almost got that thing that thing licked. So that's been a, a passion project. I went through and scored. Uh, I think I mentioned this to you earlier. Went through and scored every Nebraska football game that they played in the Big Ten era on a 1-10 to 10 scale. Um, based on just appeal, not whether they won or not. So you can look for that in the January issue. Um Got some great photo essays uh, from from the Final Four of volleyball, and then Eric Francis with that recent wrestling match. Uh, got some great images there, so you can check for that. And uh, wrap it up a little more 2022 recruiting in there, which is kind of our first chance to do that. Yep, big weekend for Nebraska. Vogues, have a good weekend. Uh, give the little man a high five, all right? Sounds good, guys. Thanks. There he is. Thanks, Brandon Vogel with us. HailVarsity.com and Magazine Managing Editor at Brandon L. Vogel. And, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a question parents have to ask each night Nebraska men's basketball's on the tube. Do I let my son or daughter watch this? <sighs> yeah, it's it's been I, – I saw something else, like, unverified, but it's something like Frost and Hoiberg combined 0 for 40 against ranked teams. That's awful. <laughs> And I'm not surprised, but it's it's probably in that neighborhood. Well, what's your 40? What's your pain threshold like right now? Will Wilson, you know, you're a big Husker basketball fan. Doc wasn't this, you know, Doc wasn't this bad. I love I love Doc. Me too. Me too. It's just but we felt like when Doc got when T.O. made the move on Doc, it was time. Mm -hmm. And you brought in this stand up comedian turned showman that in year two. Made it happen and had an incredible assistant in Craig Smith, who's now at Utah. <laughs> and a recruiter, Kenyon Hunter. Well, that and, and Michael Lewis. I'm watching Bill Walton yeah. talk about LSD in Oregon. And, you know, he's like, well, there's Michael Lewis talking. I mean, Michael Lewis was on staff, for God's sake, under, under Miles. Now he's at UCLA killing it for Mick Cronin. And, and Michael Lewis could have kept some of that in-state talent here or at least given you a good shot. Cranach, you don't have a point guard, dude. And the no. point guard you should have is killing it at Wisconsin right now. No, and you don't have physicality in the front court outside of Walker. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, you're, you're lacking a lot right now. And you wonder at the end of the year how it will shake out. Like the, the, the bit of talent that you do have – are they just going to bounce? Just I, like, I don't know. I don't know if, if McGowan's and Walker, they, they absolutely can leave, but they've got to be like just shaking their head at this and saying, man, we're better than this. Do those two guys have an extra year? Maybe they stick. Uh, I don't know who Bryce McGowan's is going to listen to. Uh, if he'll listen to folks that have his best interest in mind or their best interest in mind when it comes to going pro. Because he'll go, he can go play pro ball. But do you want to be in the the G League, or do you want to do you want to sit and and eventually, you know, by by year three or four in your you know your pro career finally get developed that way, or do you want to spend another year in 
in college? Do you transfer even? I mean, I, and I'm just speculating. I have no insight. I'm just, he needs yeah. to get bigger and stronger because you see some natural talent. And, and you got to quit whiffing on point guards. I mean, you're 0 for 3. Yeah. Yeah, it's... <laughs> It's pretty. It's pretty poor to watch, man. I, I, you wonder how it's going to be when Trey McGowan's comes back because what he brings is what Nebraska has been lacking. Yes, you know, but time. I, I don't know if one person is going to supercharge that thing and change it too much. But we'll see. We got to hit the break. Uh, Will Wilson's like, shut up, Schmidt. Get to commercial. The Iron Horse coming up. Gary Sharp next on Hale Varsity. <laughs> Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, with Chris Schmidt and Mark Cranek. Why down the weekend, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by the Nebraska Lottery, Chris Schmidt, Mark Cranek, Will Wilson. We welcome in the Iron Horse, Gary Sharp, with us. And uh, we say hi, good morning to Sharpie. Gary, uh, thanks for the time. I want to get your take here and start off in the world of recruiting. Big weekend for the Big Red, but specifically in, in Lincoln and the region, You've got a couple of kids, uh, Malachi Coleman, Avery Johnson, two names, Johnson the quarterback in Kansas, Malachi a stud out of East. Uh, Nebraska's two newer assistants, Bill Bush and Mickey Joseph, uh, very uh, active in recruiting. What can those two guys do, bud, uh, when it comes to shoring up things in-state and in-region? Well, let's, uh, let's talk about in-state. Uh, they're both very organized. Nebraska's recruiting efforts have been really disorganized over the last couple of years uh, of who to offer, where prospects are, how we're going to go about them, how we're going to do them. Um, some coaches are better organized than others, but the overall effort, I think at times, has been disorganized. And all you had to, to know is what Avery Johnson said when Bill Bush offered it. Uh, I think it's important what Mickey Joseph is doing. Uh, Scott Frost has an Omaha problem. Nebraska football has an Omaha problem. Some guys can't connect with the prospects in Omaha and reach them on a level. And Mickey Joseph is perfect for that. And I love the idea that Mickey Joseph was in local high schools. And Mickey Joseph is going to help Scott Frost in Omaha. Uh, You know, he's a dynamic recruiter. He can reach guys on a different level that maybe Scott or or Barrett Root, who recruits Omaha, can't do. So I think it's a great, great move. Now, with Malachi Coleman, I think it's important because Malachi Coleman has a lot of options. I think he really likes Michigan. Um, but he's also very close to his family. And staying in Lincoln is a very much a possibility. And getting Mickey Joseph involved to build, to start to build a relationship, I think is key for Nebraska. And I think if they can continue to build that relationship, I think Malachi Coleman stays home. Now, it'll be a while, I think, before he says where he's going. But uh, Nebraska's approach to him right now, I think, is really, really good. How about Trev coming out this week related to football here? Um, it, how about Trev coming out this week saying, hey, how about we start by becoming the most physical football team in the Midwest? And he said it with just in, within the context of, look, let's quit worrying about trying to be a national championship contender right now. <laughs> like baby steps. <laughs> You're three and three nine. Three and nine. We haven't <laughs> been to a bowl game since 2016. Like, Hello. Um, well, what do you think of me, him coming out there and painting a picture for even the style of football that he's interested in? And how do you think that was received by Scott Frost, who maybe has talked about being physical, but hasn't necessarily called physical games or yielded physical offensive lines? Well, how comfortable are you with the athletic director is actually the general manager of Nebraska football? Because that's essentially what it sounded like. If I'm inside of that program, and I'm not new to the party. And there was one other line that he said about, we've got to learn to tie our shoes first. Yes. I'm, I'm thinking, oh, boy. Oh, boy. He's saying that about my football program. Now, you can take it a couple of different ways. But I think Trev's kind of tearing it down to start to build it back up and to build the cachet that goes along with Nebraska football. I mean, this, there's a lot of Trev Albert's fingerprints all over the off season. And, you know, he's, he's got an investment. We all have an investment. Nebraska football has to win. And have they found the right pieces to help them win, whether they're in a helmet or, or a headset. But I appreciate the honesty from the athletic director. You know, we've had, we've had some blowhards in that chair where they just kind of say, you know, like they're at a pep rally. Or they say stuff and we go, what? 
I think Trev has a different approach. I mean, he is a caretaker of Nebraska football, and he wants his football coach to succeed. But you have to realize what has been an issue in the past and address it, address it before you move, move forward. But with that said, I said this on my show yesterday. Damon and I were talking. If you look at where Nebraska was, let's say, December 1, to where they are on January 15th, Nebraska has kind of checked the boxes and things they needed to accomplish. I think they've had a productive off season. What does that mean when you get to this, the regular season? Well, you know, remains to be seen. But I think they've had a good six weeks that we'll see if they can continue that momentum with whatever comes out of this weekend. And, of course, there's still more maneuvering on the roster. Gary Sharp is with us, the Iron Horse Weekend Edition, Hail Varsity Radio. Sharp, you mentioned uh, previous and current athletic directors. Uh, let's go to Nebraska basketball for just a moment. Last night, even if Nebraska would have shot better, I mean, Purdue's, a, Purdue's a, just a machine. With what they do outside and inside, they're going to drill a lot of teams. But it's another you know, 30-point or in-that-realm loss. This wasn't a quit job. This was just a kill job by Purdue. But overall, you know, earlier in the week, you've got the, the news of, oh, yeah, by the way, here's, here's an extension, Fred, thanks, uh, by Moose back, you know, a year and a half ago. What, what's next here for Nebraska basketball uh, as, as Trev looks at it? And the fan base, man, that place is always buzzing and jumping, no matter if they're five games under 500 or they're hovering around a, a postseason berth. I mean, we, we've seen both instances, but this just feels different. This just feels bad this year. Uh, the, the, the stats, the record, you can't run away from that. Uh, they tell all the story. Last night's game was one team that is a Final Four contender, and the other team is at the bottom of the Big Ten. That's mm-hmm. the reality of it. And so you have to flush that game quickly, and I don't think you can take anything away from last night's game other than Purdue, when they get rolling downhill, they are really, really good. Now it becomes the focus of Monday night at home against Indiana because there were a lot of empty seats the last home game. There's a lot of people that are disgruntled. There's a lot of people that sit in the stands and, and follow that team and say, I can't relate to Nebraska. The offense is disjointed. I, it just, it, it's not fun. It it's, looks like it's the same old, same old again. So I think Monday night becomes a pretty important night for Nebraska against an Indiana team that will come in and they will play with a sense of desperation. Um, it's in a weird spot right now. You know, it, it, everybody thought that Fred was going to be the guy. And if Fred can't do it, that doesn't mean that somebody else can't do it. But this was supposed to fix Nebraska basketball. And clearly right now, it's not working. And right now, between now and the end of the year, you wonder, how do you judge Fred Hoiberg? Is it guys don't quit? They get better? They win some games? Because Nebraska, probably if I go through the schedule, they're staring at a 3-17 and Big Ten record. That number isn't going to look good when you're at the end of year three on the heels of raising ticket prices in a place that used to be fun to go to. The atmosphere isn't very fun this year, whether it's their winning or the game presentation. they got to fix something quick, but I think Monday night is really, really big for Nebraska basketball. Gary, they've, they've had 27 scholarship basketball players since Hoiberg has been here. I mean, do you, do you just kind of stop right there? And just be like, well, what do you expect? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, but but it, you know, you're right, Mark. And and continuity is key. And you know, the old adage, "Get old, stay old." Well, sometimes you like guys that are one and done, and or two and done guys, and they go on to the pros. And you know how the portal works. Um, that's the problem. You know, with fans like, I, man, I have no idea who's here. It's a a revolving door. What is your plan? What is your identity moving forward? Um, it's, there's a lot of things that are adding up on the wrong side for Fred because. If I stopped you on the street and said, hey, I'm invested in Nebraska basketball, why are you invested in Nebraska basketball? What would you say? Uh, it's uh, tradition. Uh, it's the, I have a lot of... It's my shirts. job at this point. It's my job. <laughs> I mean, are, are, do, you, do, you say, do you say, I'm invested because, man, I, I really want Trey McGowan to get back and be healthy and see what he can do, and, and then Walker continue to develop, and that's absolutely true. And, and maybe they come back next year. I mean, it, it's tough to latch on to something moving forward with what you've seen right now. I mean, it's just, it's ugly. I, you know, last night was a quick watch. You're like, well, you know, this isn't going to work well. Foul trouble early. That's why I keep going back. Monday night, the way Nebraska plays and the response by the fans, I think is 
very, very important because that's an Indiana team that is thinking they're an NCAA team and they're coming off a loss on the road at Iowa. Gary Sharp, so the Sharpie of thought uh, with the NFL this weekend and big time showcase. I know you're uh, you're getting your your war paint on for the Chiefs on Sunday night, but this is really cool. And and you've got Zach Taylor and Stanley Morgan and that uh, the the Burrow connection with Nebraska. You, you've got a lot of new Cincinnati fans in this state, or they're at least interested in the Bengals for the first time since Icky Woods, right? So, yeah, it'll be, a, it'll be a fun showcase today. Are you surprised at the success Zach has had in Cincy? Because it looked pretty bumpy early. I, I am surprised. Throw Troy Walters in there yes. as well. Yep, uh, his tweet today. He, he's part of Zach Taylor's staff. I am a little bit because I thought, you know, it wasn't going well with Zach, and if his quarterback is not developing, that comes back on the head coach. But they've been able to find a chemistry and, oh, by the way, find Jamar Chase out of the draft to go with his world-class young quarterback. And things have clicked, and it's good. I mean, Zach Taylor, through all of us covering Nebraska football and fans, Zach Taylor is one of the really, really good guys that have rolled through Nebraska. And he was one of the really good quarterbacks that have rolled through Nebraska, and there haven't been a ton in the last 20 years or so. So I'm happy for him. But it's the pressure cooker of what they've developed now in Cincinnati, winning a division title. If Cincinnati gets upset today by the Raiders, and there's that possibility. I mean, the Raiders are playing really well. People go, well, it's Zach Taylor's fault. But he's in a good spot, and I'm happy for him. Uh, He's a good football man. And, you know, he was on the verge of getting fired if this year didn't turn out so well. And now he's on the verge of, you know, continuing in Cincinnati for a while, and they may have something um, really good cooking. But he's a good football guy, and – you know, I know he still keeps Nebraska at the forefront when he talks about his experience, and that is uh, that is great for Nebraska. And I'm glad to, to read all the stories locally that are you know talking to his teammates and, and people saying, you know what, I knew when I was playing with him, he played like a he played like a coach. Not surprised that he worked his way up through Mike Sherman, his father-in-law, Sean McVay, and now running his own team in Cincinnati and in the playoffs. Yeah, you know, Gary, I've. I've... If, as you handicap the NFC and the AFC, it feels like Green Bay is the front runner in the NFC, but AFC feels a lot more wide open. How, how do you handicap that? Who, who are you seeing as the front runner? Kansas City. Well, of course. <laughs> Again, he's wearing <laughs> the war paint. Hat. Take off your <laughs> Chiefs hat. You, you, I mean, do you really, do you think that objectively? I it, going through Tennessee, going to Nashville is going to be tough for anybody. That's a really well built team and a coach that walks around with this huge chip on his shoulder. So going and beating Tennessee on the home field is going to be very difficult. I don't know what I'm going to get out of Kansas City. I know the line is huge tomorrow night against Pittsburgh, but Kansas City has been, you know, the one game that they played a full 60 was against Pittsburgh, ironically, the day after Christmas. So I'm not sure what I'm going to get. Their defense hasn't been good the last two. And I like I like where Buffalo's going. I mean, Buffalo's kind of built for bad weather this time of the year. They've got the number one defense. Josh Allen has more playoff experience. I like the Bills, um, but I think the AFC, you guys are right, it's kind of up in the air. Where in the NFC, people are narrowing in and going, man, the most complete team is Green Bay, and the Super Bowl, road to the Super Bowl goes through Lambeau. Sharpie, we'll let you get out, bud. Uh, last thought here, and we'll, we'll end it with Nebraska football and Coach Applewhite coming in. Uh, you're a read on the hire. I know that you know Coach Brown was under consideration, maybe an NFL option. Coach Knox down at you know at Florida, but uh, Applewhite, uh, the guy. Uh, what what do you like about him, and what what's been the the biggest issue with that room? Has it been talent, or has it been the development? It's been mismanaged. It's. You know, I think Ryan Held tried a lot of different things. Nebraska hasn't had a 1,000-yard rusher since Ozigbo. You don't know who's playing. Guys don't know where they stand. It's been mismanaged. Um, now you have a Power 5 experience coach that comes in. Uh, I think he's also a really good recruiter. I think, he, I think he's a solid addition. I think of uh, the additions for Nebraska, and that includes elevating Bill Bush. I think they're solid. I think the only guy that was hired is program altering is Mickey Joseph. But – I think Applewhite is, is good for that room because guys in that room, I think, can relate to him, and he's got a good resume. But he's got, he's got some interesting decisions to make. I mean, we may, we may get to next Saturday, guys, and there may be eight scholarship guys in that room. So they're going to have to do 
you know, we have to make some decisions. You know, watch Marquis step. I'm not sure that, you know, he's going to be around for 2022. And there's a lot of running backs in that room, and he got some decisions to make, especially with a guy who started last year in Urban that might not be available until after spring. But I, I like the hire. I think it comes with experience. I think it's important that hires that were made have Power 5 experience compared to guys previously in that position that were very new at Power 5 football and maybe were not ready for the adjustment from Group of Five. Gary Sharp, the Iron Horse. Sharpie, uh, when are you on today or this weekend with uh, UNO Hoops? Hey, I am a lovely Vermilion, South Dakota guy. All right. Good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. The, yeah. What's what's the bar there in, in downtown Vermilion? I know it's kind of a newer bar. I went up there with Garth. This is many Christmases ago to watch UNO. Well, I saw uh, you up there uh, I, I, four yeah, or five years right. ago. I, I'm not sure what the bar is. I know we ate at a restaurant last night called the Old Lumber Company. Yes, that's it. That, that's okay. it. Yeah, yep. So How was nice, it? Yay or uh, nay? It was, it was good. It's a uh, you know, nice little downtown. Of course, it was uh, snowing uh, last night. It's one of those places where the team hotel is across the street from the arena. There's not many places where you have that option. <laughs> No, the uh, the old uh, the old Yote Dome, man. It's it's a good setup. Craig Smith was up there, man, and he helped to fundraise for that that. Uh, yeah, they, have, they have a beautiful facility. basketball facility. Yeah, that was good. Sharpie, enjoy uh, South Dakota. Stay warm, and we'll check in next weekend. But thanks, guys. Enjoy the pursuit of uh, Chuba Purdy today, and the and the family on campus watches social media. Oh, he'll uh, he'll be smiling. I'm sure. Hey, thanks, guys. <laughs> Take care, but there he is, Gary Sharp with us. Uh, is it Chuba or Chuba? I've always gone with the I, Chuba thing. I would go Chuba, obviously, yeah. but maybe it is Chuba. I don't know. Like don't Tuba. Know. We might have to. We might have to really get that thing down because he may commit to Nebraska. Well, it, I, I you know enjoy, what that means. That's right. I don't. I don't know what that means. It means, means he might. Means you have another quarterback. <laughs> yeah, it means you have like seventeen quarterbacks. Uh, and a couple of transfers, yeah. I'll say this. Whipple had like seven quarterbacks uh, in his quarterback room at Pitt. No one wanted to leave. They all liked the guy. That's good. Yeah. He's kind of classic coach guy. Like He's I see fun. him wearing bike shorts and having a whistle. And... He's your PE teacher. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. Great act. Take your, uh, your gym clothes home this weekend. You're starting to attract flies. Yeah. You guys are playing like a bunch of Twinkies. Yeah. <laughs> Rub some dirt yeah. on it. I, I see him doing that. Get me another car. Call everybody Twinkies. <laughs> Twink. Uh. <laughs> I would hope you go with some other language. Great act. Uh, enjoy your weekend, dude. Thanks for the time. You as well, sir. All right. Uh, Roadshow Monday, single barrel ahead of Nebraska, Indiana with Hale Varsity. See ya.